Good afternoon, my name is Candida Steele and I'm retired as a judge from the U.S. Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. I handled uh, federal government contract disputes um, all over the country and I'm sorry my phone is making noises, I'll go throw it away. <laughs> and my name is Ben Glickman, I'm a supervising deputy attorney general with the state of California. Uh, much more importantly, I'm an alumnus of We the People and was lucky enough to be on a national championship team uh, way back in 1995. And you can see we're in the House Intelligence Committee room today, so welcome to Capitol Hill. And my name is Marsha Holland. I'm here in Missoula, Montana. I was a career public defender in Alaska, but upon moving to Montana, I now teach at the law school here. And I think like Judge Steele, we have both been involved in the We the People program for many years, probably many more than however old you are. So we are so thrilled that you are allowing us to participate in this program with you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And if you'd tell us who you are, please. Hi, I'm Sasha, and we're from Lincoln High School here in Portland, Oregon. We're from Unit 3, and we study how the Constitution has been amended to further the ideals present in the Declaration of Independence. Good afternoon, I'm Leo. Hello, I'm Caroline. Hi, I'm Kyler. Good afternoon, I'm Claire. Hi, I'm Renna, and thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you to your teacher and I'm sure all the, the people watching in the background. I'll read the question for the recording. It's question number three, but it's the only one we're doing. Um, in 2020, we celebrate the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which recognized the right of women to vote. Despite recent controversy, the Equal Rights Amendment has not yet been declared ratified. What are the similarities and differences between the two amendments? What impact, if any, has the 19th Amendment had on women in achieving equality with men in the United States and around the world? What are the advantages and disadvantages of states passing their own equal rights amendments rather than ratifying a national constitutional amendment? You may begin. 19th century feminist Lucretia Mott once said, the world has never yet seen a truly great and virtuous nation because in the degradation of women, the very fountains of life are poisoned at the source. Both the ERA and the 19th Amendment aim to expand women's rights. Both echo resolutions and the Declaration of Sentiments, a document signed at the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, which argued that both men and women have unalienable rights. The two documents have contextual differences. The 19th Amendment arose during first wave feminism, which was focused on suffrage. Meanwhile, the ERA gained popularity during second wave feminism, so it is centered around gender equality domestically and in the workplace. The ratification timeline also differed between the two documents. The 19th Amendment was ratified only one year after it was passed in Congress. However, the ERA was only ratified by 35 out of the required 38 states by the 1982 deadline, and five states tried to rescind their ratifications. The 19th Amendment gave women political power, so laws were passed that advanced women's equality, such as Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972. In contrast, the ERA would provide blanket coverage to prevent government discrimination on the basis of sex. The ERA would also add protections to pre-existing laws. In the case of Title IX, for example, it would prevent discriminations in schools that do not already receive federal money. Once women could vote, issues that men had ignored made their way into the public sphere. Less than 20 years after the amendment's passage, federal courts overturned part of the Comstock Law of 1873, which prohibited the sale of contraception over the mail. The passage of the 19th Amendment incentivized the U.S. to focus on women's rights and foreign policy. In 1995, the, official office, er, the Office of Global Women's Affairs was established. In order, in order to promote women's rights around the world. Conversely, international women's rights movements have influenced the United States. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's idea to include the right to vote in the Declaration of Sentiments was inspired by the universal suffrage movement in England. The 19th Amendment did not achieve gender equality around the world. According to the 2020 Global Gender Gap Report, it will take another 257 years for women to reach, reach complete pay equality. 
Theoretically, a national ERA would be easier to pass than 50 individual state ERAs, which would be needed to make up for the lack of an overarching ERA. A report by the National Organization for Women suggests that splitting up ratification efforts actually contributes to their failures. Some states, such as Oregon, allow their constitutional amendments to be ratified by a simple majority. This makes it easy for individual states to pass ERAs, but it is also easy for states to repeal them. The national ERA would prevent both the federal and state governments from discriminating on the basis of sex. However, state, e state ERAs do not cover areas over which the federal government has sole control, such as the draft. In Sherrick v. W. at Cadillac, the New York Court of Appeals ruled that state courts can adopt a more flexible definition of state action than federal courts. Therefore, state ERAs could apply to discrimination in the private sphere where the federal ERA cannot. For example, a Colorado court held in Sandquist v. City and County of Denver that the state action requirement for their ERA was satisfied when an all-male baseball team played on a city-owned ball field even though the government itself was not responsible for the discrimination. Thank you. We are now ready for your questions. Thank you. I will begin, and I'm sure you've put away your notes, even though we can't see that part. I just want to follow up on that last point. If you look at the language used in the various state equal rights amendments, it varies a lot. And yet the, the proposed federal amendment is fairly simple language. Do you think we should stick with the language that's currently under the proposed federal amendment or are there, is there a better example out there among the state's um, individual equal rights amendments? I believe we should keep what the current statute, what the current wording is in the ERA, simply because if we add any more language or any more concepts, it may never get ratified. For example, we can see that with the 15th Amendment, they sought to include women in this amendment. And when this idea was proposed, it would have never been passed. But once they simplified it to only giving Black people the right to vote, that's when it got ratified. I agree with Sasha. I also think that um, in the case of the federal constitution, it's the job of amendments within the Constitution to protect people's rights from the government. And then it's Congress's job to add on to those with statutes that protect people's rights from private actors. I completely disagree with my colleagues. I believe that we must include gender in the language of the ERA simply because that is one of the most pressing issues. Quite, uh, that Civil Rights Act and other legislation just doesn't cover right now. Questions posed in cases such as Harris Funeral Homes v. EEOC. These questions aren't currently being answered and therefore a constitutional amendment is needed to clarify the answers. I completely disagree with Tyler. Sex is a medical term, so we should stick with it because it's something that's going to be constant. Meanwhile, because gender is a cultural thing, it's something that is going to continue to change how we view it, or something that we're contending, we continue to change how we view it. So ERA, if we want it to be something that can stick and continue to be used throughout the years, we should be using the medical term. So shifting gears a bit, why, why do we need the ERA at all? I, I don't understand. It, it seems to me we have the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. We can interpret that robustly. Wouldn't that be enough? I agree that the Equal Rights Amendment does provide a lot of, um, a lot of, it does cover a lot of areas that the ERA would aim to cover. But I think that we need the ERA because we don't have this kind of equality in the Constitution in respect to ERA language. So I think that having an ERA might even um, change sex discrimination or gender discrimination from intermediate scrutiny to strict scrutiny, bringing it up to the same level as race. I agree with Caroline. And I also think that passing the ERA is a symbolic gesture because never before in the constitution has it said that all sexes are equal. And so with this amendment, we will see that. And this can blossom into many other things happening such as um, potential reproductive rights being ensured. To build off of what Sasha said, I think another important thing about the ERA is it provides security for both court cases and statutes that protect women's rights because it's so difficult to pass a constitutional amendment. Thank you. You're muted. You're muted, Candy. <laughs> Does Joe Biden's promise to choose a woman as his vice presidential running mate 
uh, violate the spirit of the ERA or does it support the spirit of the ERA? I think that it definitely supports the spirit of the ERA. Currently, there are not enough women in government at all. As we can see in the Senate, throughout the hundreds of years of American history, there are only around 27 women in the Senate currently, and we need more um, women in our government representing other women to equal the playing field. So let me ask you this. It, even though we had the 14th Amendment, it took a while to get from Plessy versus Ferguson to Brown versus Board of Education. Even though we had the 19th Amendment, it took a while to have Congress step in to act, enact the Voting Rights Act. What issues do you see as still being litigated if the Equal Rights Amendment were to pass tomorrow or next week? One big issue that I see every single day is the lack of attention being paid towards sexual assault and rape cases. And I would propose a piece of legislation that was um, victim, sur yeah, a survivor surrounded legislation that focused on the survivor's interactions with the court, um, the abuser, as well as its legal workers in order to ensure that they're in a safe environment. I think another case that is kind of pending litigation right now is the role of women in the selected service system. In the, national, in the case National Coalition for Men be selected service, the Southern District for Texas, but not the Supreme Court, ruled that it was unconstitutional to uh, not have women enter the draft. And so I think that if the ERA were to be passed, then, this, uh, then likely this would be reaffirmed by the federal government and that the federal government would be ordered to include women in the selected service program. So would the ERA mean there's never a circumstance where it's appropriate for government to distinguish between the sexes or the genders? I don't think that the ERA would uh, determine this because we can just look back to Supreme Court precedent uh, where in the case uh, Johnson v. Uh, Transportation Agency Santa Clara, the court ruled that employers can use affirmative action on the basis of sex to get, give women employment opportunities where they ha have been historically underrepresented. I think the ERA would do something similar. Time. Thank you. Wow, wow. That was just excellent. You I'll start, point, Sure. I really appreciate that you have been thoughtful about how this issue or many of these issues have been percolating in the United States for a long time. In your prepared remarks, you really captured that by the 1843 convention, by walking us through, by explaining that you know, Title IX took a while to get to. And I really like that organization because it gave us good starting points for our um, questions. And I really like the answer to my question because I think it's somewhat complicated about what model are we going to use if we do adopt an equal rights amendment. And, and finally, the answers concerning the draft and other issues that will still be you know, in the forefront of litigation or in the courts, even if an EP, ERA passes. I, you're very thoughtful. This is going to happen in your lifetimes. And I'm so glad you're thinking about this now because this is unfold, this will continue to unfold during your, your lifetime and you know so much about this and are so engaged. I so appreciate your thoughtfulness. Yeah, I, I, would, I would echo that. Uh, you guys covered a lot of ground in your, in your prepared remarks and, and, and it was well-structured and easy to follow, which is always appreciated. Um, you had some interesting examples in there. I, I like you know, the kind of flipping the question and, and noting that you know, the international movements actually influenced uh, the U.S. perhaps to a greater degree than, than our movements influenced theirs. Um, I think that's a, an interesting uh, take on that. Um, on the q and I thought you guys, you know, you, you obviously talked about these questions and thought about these questions before. Uh, I might have, uh, my question about is the Equal Protection Clause uh, sufficient? You, you mentioned the levels of scrutiny, which I think is critical to that question. I would maybe like to hear, you know, why is that so critical? What what is the functional difference between a strict scrutiny review and an intermediate scrutiny review? Likewise, I think you mentioned this uh, maybe in the prepared remarks, but the 14th Amendment you know, applies to state action, whereas the ERA would not necessarily have to be so limited, right? It could be written more broadly. 
uh, to apply to private action as well. And so, but I mean, these are nits, uh, truly nits that we're picking. Uh, you obviously had had done the work and, and knew your stuff. And I, I really, I just wish we had more time to talk about it. There, there. You go. keep managing not to unmute, I'm sorry. I think that was a really lovely presentation. Thank you, you did a really beautiful job. Um, I was in, I have to say for the, the, the first time that we've heard anything in the ERA having to do with sexual assault. And this is the last hearing that we've had over two days. So I thought that was a very interesting point that you made. Um, and I certainly agree with my colleagues. Um, you did a really wonderful job. But what I want you to do is, I, I bet you've had a really fun time doing this. Have you enjoyed working on this, all of you? Yeah. Good, because it shows. And um, I know that it will be a cherished memory for you the rest of your lives that you've participated in this. But I hope that it will do more than just have trained you to be good citizens and go and vote and listen to the news and talk to your friends um, because you're way beyond um, the level that you need to be able to be a, a successful citizen in this country. You've got the experience now um, to do much more than that for the rest of us. And I have to say that you've shown that you know more than my constitutional law class knew in law school. So um, you're already way ahead of the game. And I hope that that means that you might be inspired or bitten to uh, do something with this experience and, and um, be a legislator or uh, local government or representative or senator for us um, down the road. Um, certainly being lawyers or judges would be a good thing to start. Um, but it's been a real pleasure hearing you and uh, I must say that I'd be, um, I'll be sleeping a whole lot better knowing that your generation is going to be taken care of us because you certainly know a whole lot more than a lot of people who are running things right now. So thank you. It's been a pleasure hearing you and I, you. I wish thank you all the luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks to your teachers and family and friends. Great job. Sorry, I should have said that too. Exactly so. All right, exactly good luck. so.